All right, so I'm going to try to be uh, really direct and honest. Um, Thank you. So, um, short statement and then two, two related questions. Short statement, um, I, I'm immediately uh, angered and offended that this kind of thing happens on public property. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what, where I'm coming from. But yep. given that, I'm going to try to ask very honest, direct questions. You bet. Um, so on the Can first... I respond to your first statement? Yeah, of course. I think what you've just expressed is the essence of intolerance. I respect anybody's right to stand out here, be they atheist, communist, Marxist, Leninist, capitalist, agnostic, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, and say what they want to say. And I'm very grateful that I live in a country that supports free speech. Secondly, I thought that I was in a liberal arts educational environment. I thought that the basis of liberal arts education was the belief in the free exchange of ideas, the right to disagree with each other and then to explain respectfully why we disagree. This is an imbalanced conversation. When you have an enormous institution and a huge amount of people behind you on one side and a very small number of dissenters, oh, that's really? not free speech. Tell me who's behind me. What's this big institution that's behind me? Um, well, the majority of people here are listening very reverently. This isn't like a, a two-sided debate. Um, Sir, you're not having, no one has forced you to stand here. No one's forced me to stand here. I'm under the impression that you have a free will and you've chosen to be there. And I respect that. And these people choose to sit here because they choose to. I don't know who they are. And I don't have any big organization behind me for crying out loud. So why don't you get in touch with reality? It's a refreshing exercise. Well, I was hesitant to stand up anyway, but I would actually like to ask two questions, and they're coming from my heart, okay? Okay. Um, as someone who has been raised outside of the church, and I just don't take the Bible as evidence, is there any way that I could be converted? Is that the only way that you can reach out to someone that doesn't have any kind of cultural upbringing, that hasn't been raised with already those doubts? How can you speak to someone who is absolutely legitimately an atheist? I mean, please answer directly. I have many friends who are former atheists. And these people who are former atheists relax their mind. They tried to be as objective as possible and to look at the evidence that God exists. And then once they move from atheism to theism, then they relax their mind. They tried to be as objective as possible and read the Gospels, not as the Word of God, simply as accurate history, because the evidence is the Gospels give us some accurate history. And confronted by the lifestyle, teachings, death, and resurrection of Christ, they saw the evidence is Christ is reliable, and they chose to put their faith in him. So you, you, you said that there were two steps there? The second step, once you've acknowledged that there could be some sort of right. all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good thing, right. um, the second, after, once you've done that, that's fine. It's that first step that I'm really concerned with. So you're saying that there's actually fact-based evidence that is best explained through an existence of God. Philosophical evidence, yes, sir. I'm not talking specifically about um, experiments or anything like that, but even even philosophical evidence. Philosophical you think, evidence. You think that's the best, most rational explanation? Yes. Okay, so we, we have thousands of years of history of, dis of debates about these kind of things, and I don't want to revisit those, but do you have an answer for someone who's already gone through those and hasn't been convinced of the factual accu accuracy or of Occam's razor? I mean, if, there, if, if I honestly think that there are just more reliable descriptions that match the facts better. Theory that just has fewer things that you have to assume that explain it just as well. If I'm in that position, knowing that I am a limited person and could be wrong, is there room for faith? That was kind of a technical question. Would you like me to try to repeat it? Mm -hmm. So is it? do you think that it's possible to both think that the best answer is atheism? That, that I can logically disprove the existence of the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good. Yet, through knowing my own limitation, through knowing that logic itself can be flawed, that our brains cannot understand everything, is that enough of a doubt to admit the kind of faith that's required to believe in God? So first, I want to try to understand this question. I've heard all the evidence there is saying that there is a God. I don't want to revisit any of that evidence. But do you have any other evidence, even though I know that you don't know what I know? Do you have anything besides that? All you've got to do is 
look at the evidence for the reliability of Christ. Then you say, no, I'm sorry, not enough evidence, I can't believe. But when you say that, what you are clearly saying is, before I trust anything to be true, it must meet this level of evidence. So my two questions for you then are, in light of the fact that Jesus Christ is not supported by enough evidence, what is the object that you have chosen to trust in? And secondly, what is the preponderance of evidence that supports this option as being more reliable than Christ? I would say that the, dis the discussion isn't between two different things that, that explain the, the, the environment that we see, but it's a very specific proposition of either an all-knowing, all-powerful God exists, or it doesn't. And I believe that the evidence supports the second. And I don't think that you need to, you, that, that that argument specifically requires there to be something else that you believe in. Just like, I mean, you can talk about the non-existence of something. If it were, if it logically would impact your life in some way, and it doesn't impact in your life in that way, then it doesn't exist without positing something else instead. So look, if you are choosing to say that there's not enough evidence for the existence of a God, but you are living your life by some set of rules, things we should do, things we shouldn't do, then you have to explain why. What are you going by? The things that we should and shouldn't be doing. If there is no God, that means there is no ultimate consequence for anything other than the set of rules that are in place that we're following for whatever reason that you're choosing to believe that we have to follow those rules. Tonight, when you put your head on your pillow, tonight when I put my head on my pillow, like it or not, you are living for something or someone. Like it or not, I'm living for someone or something. You have said the reason that you cannot believe in Christ is because of a lack of evidence. No, I said an evidence against. That's a very important difference. All right, fine. Evidence against. Okay. So what I need to challenge you to do is explain to me what or who you are living for and why. What's all the evidence that points to whatever the option is you've chosen other than Christ? What's this overwhelming evidence that has convinced you that this option is more trustworthy than Christ? Well, we're talking about two different things here. Um, and I, I'm, going to, I'm trying to answer your question. This is the only way I know how. Um, I'm talking about whether something exists or not. And you brought in value. You brought in why, why are you living? What are you living for? You, you know, what, why are you good? Something like that. Like, what is your purpose? And the question that I was asking was very much about what exists. And if God does not exist, frankly, if nothing above me exists, that doesn't imply that I have nothing to live for. Right. That, yeah, and I do definitely have things to live for that right. I can specifically point to that have nothing to do with whether there's a God. That's right. I know that. Okay. Then I, just I don't understand I just... why there's a connection there. For some reason, you and the two gentlemen before, I'm not sure that you guys respect language the way I do. How do you mean? I agree with those who say that language can just be a power move to assert your power. And that happens at times. But I'm convinced that if we take language seriously and if we listen to each other, we can have meaningful conversation. I thought I just said to you, tonight, when you put your head on your pillow, like it or not, you're going to have to acknowledge you're living for something or someone. Yes. Like it or not, when I put my head on my pillow tonight, I'm going to have to acknowledge I'm living for someone or something. I agree with that. We both have faith. Now, you have said to me crystal clearly that there is not enough evidence that God exists, and you didn't want to hear me go over that evidence, and I respect that. And you have also clearly said that there's not enough evidence that Jesus Christ is reliable. Fine, no problem. But when you say to me, the reason you can't believe that God exists, the reason you can't believe that Jesus Christ is the truth is because of lack of evidence, in order not to be an intellectual hypocrite, I'm asking you, what do you live for? And what's this preponderance of evidence that convinces you that this option is superior to God to Christ? I can answer the question. I just didn't Please think do. it was relevant to the conversation. I, I, I believe in flourishing, in human flourishing, in eudaimonia. I believe that, that we have 
goodness in our lives, that there are good things to experience, and good things to learn and be. I mean, it, it's there. there is an inherent goodness to human life that has no relationship with anything higher than humanity. And once you acknowledge that there's something higher than humanity, it belittles us. I, I, I specifically, just so I don't get off topic, that what I live for is flourishing. Who so, defines flourishing? I do, for myself. Now we're getting somewhere. What's your purpose for living? To flourish. Who defines flourishing? Yourself. Got it. Now let's think for a second. What if everybody on the planet decided that they're going to live their life according to that exact standard and they're going to make their own definition of what it means to flourish? Fine. And the KKK defines flourishing for themselves. That's fine. It's that doesn't fine? mean they're right. Did he just say that doesn't make them right? Where is right coming from? And the terrorists who bombed and shot people in Paris define flourishing for themselves. Yeah, but now you're you're making so you asked what I live for. You did not say, do I believe in some sort of absolute good? I, I did. I did not. I asked you, how do you define flourishing? Who defines flourishing? We each define flourishing. Okay. Now, if you think about it, you're going to realize you've thought it one way. Define flourishing one way. The terrorists have obviously defined it another way. Nobody's right. Nobody's wrong. It's all relative. I'm not talking about ethics. That's why I said this was outside of the realm of the conversation. This has everything to do with the question that he's asking. Because if you're choosing to believe that there's not enough evidence for a God, then you don't get to live as if there is a God. Saying that these people are right and these people are wrong, we made that up ourselves. So we're either making that up individually for ourselves. We're either making that up as a group of people like Germany did when they exterminated all of the Jews or we're, we're using people that are in power to to create this morality for everybody or there's a God that did it. But you don't get to say that there's not enough evidence for a God, but then say that there's an ultimate right or wrong like there is a God. You don't get to borrow from the God worldview to try to make your worldview work. Flourishing does not include ethics? You asked what I live for. Yeah, flourishing, you said. Yeah, that's not an ethical statement. That's a psychological statement. Does that include statement. ethics? To flourish as a human being, does that include understanding what's good? I thought you used no, the word goodness. It includes goodness. It doesn't understand the... It, the, the un, it does not include the understanding of goodness. It includes my, goodness, my, but not the understanding of goodness. My moral imperative is Language is breaking down. Not killing someone is a good thing, but I don't have an understanding of what a good thing is. My honest question, one that I've asked of priests in the past when I was really questioning, my honest question is, can, is faith compatible with, with this idea? That, that's, that's a very specific question, okay? With, with flourishing? With the fact that my logic is limited, I could be wrong. I know that I could be wrong. Whether you take that same idea and apply it to flourishing, yes, I am going to do my utmost to be a good person, but that does not mean that I know what good is. I don't lay any sort of claim to absolute goodness. So, since you admittedly acknowledge that you have no ultimate standard of right or wrong, you have no business telling anybody else what right or wrong is. Even if that is doing something that you really believe is wrong, it doesn't matter what you believe. Now, you just can't live in a vacuum and say, well, it really doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. You have to make a judgment call. Is that right or wrong? You have to make a judgment call. Is the KKK right or wrong in denigrating black people and elevating Aryan supremacy? You can't just live in a vacuum and say, well, it, it's irrelevant. It's not irrelevant. It's real life. So who defines flourishing? And if you define it, then what makes your definition right and the KKK or the terrorist definition wrong. Our disagreement isn't about what flourishing is. Our disagreement seems to be that you think that there has to be this objective rule. And if I'm not following that, you even specifically said it earlier, that's why I stood up. You, you accused anyone who does not have an absolute idea of ethics as being a relativist. You're, you're accusing me of being a relativist and saying that I believe this and someone else believes that and that we're both right in our own spheres. And there is there are other ethical views besides absolutism and relativism. No, there's not. There's either an ultimate right or wrong or 
we are all making it up somehow for ourselves. There is no other in between. There is either an ultimate or there's relative. That is it. That's just totally unfair and doesn't match our human experience. So, I mean, I... It matches my experience totally as it does Camus, Sartre and Nietzsche, Bertrand Russell, and all the great atheistic thinkers who had the intellectual honesty to acknowledge if there is no God, there is no mind prior to the human mind, which means it's obviously the human mind that defines justice and injustice, what it means to flourish or not flourish, what it means to live a good life or not to live a good life. It's all the creation of the human mind. It's a human fantasy. Those are my fantasy thing. is not superior to your fantasy. Your fantasy is not superior to my fantasy. It's all relative. And I'm saying, sir, I don't think you can live that way. I, I think agree. I could be wrong. I think you live as if the terrorist attacks in Paris, France were absolutely wrong. You see, you can't say that if you're going to hold to what you believe in, which is there is no God. Morality is relative. I define flourishing. I define goodness for myself. Fine. If what you say is true, if what you believe is true, then have the intellectual honesty to say the terrorists define good, flourishing life their own way. They're not wrong. I'm not right. It's all a taste. It's a matter of taste. In case it's not obvious, I do think that atrocities are wrong. In case it's not obvious, I think that there are incredibly bad things happening in the world and that we have a personal responsibility to stand up and do something about it. I am sure you do. Our disagreement's not about that. that. Our disagreement is about whether there's an intermediate ground, not even intermediate, putting it on a spectrum is false, but something that's neither absolutism nor relativism. I am convinced at this point in the video, if you do not understand the point that Cliff is making here, you are either not listening or you are suppressing the truth so you do not have to answer this question because a 10 year old can understand the point that he's trying to make right now. I mean, honestly, I wanted to ask the question about given that I just don't see the evidence, but it is the knowledge of my own lack enough to admit faith. And it seems like what you're saying is, no, you have to admit the evidence. And what that means to me is that I can't have faith. Then. So that's, that's my conclusion here, unless, unless you'd like to try to answer that question. The reason it's so frustrating to talk with you is because I don't think you listen to me very carefully. I'm sorry. I, I think I feel like I have been. I'm sorry if we're not. I said, sir, you have faith. I have faith. Don't you remember? I talked about tonight. Both of us are going to put our heads on our pillows. <laughs> sir, I went over it twice with you. Yes, but that's you're very not smart. Well, there's, there's a problem. Yes, I am answering you're your question. Not with a yes, no answer. Not with a yes, no answer. I'm trying to point out to you that every atheist, every agnostic, every Muslim, Jew, Christian, we all have faith. What does that mean? It means that all of us have to deal with the basic fundamental questions. Why is a human being valuable? Is there a purpose to life? Why do I behave ethically the way I do? Is there life after death or is there not? None of us can scientifically prove that our answers to any of those four questions are absolutely true. Instead, they are philosophical questions that you have to use logic, experience, observation to answer. We all answer them, though. All of us have answers to the question. Is a human being worth anything? Yes or no? Is there a purpose to life? Yes or no? Is it right or wrong to bomb people in Paris and be part of the KKK? Yes or no? Is there life after death or not? Yes or no? We all have to struggle with those issues. You have no choice. Why? Because you have to live life. That's why. You all answer them. Now guess what? All of us have faith when we answer those questions. None of us can prove that our answers to any of those questions is right. So sir, please don't walk away from here telling me or thinking that I didn't say you have faith. I know you have got faith. Same way I've got faith. You just have a different faith from me. That's all. An atheist has faith. Just a different faith than I do. We all have faith. Trusting that something is true, not because we can prove it, but hopefully because we've got evidence. And that's why I pressed you, sir, and said, what's your faith in? And what's the evidence that whatever it is that you believe in, 
is reliable. So I've been straight as an arrow with you, you sir. I agree with everything you just said, honestly. Well, good. No, that, that's not. I, the problem is that that's not speaking to whether there's a God. And I'm specifically asking about that. No, you cut me off at the knees when it came to answering that. I'm sorry? How? You cut me off intellectually at the knees because I started to answer you and you said, I don't want to go through all those arguments that have gone over the past 2,000 years over whether God exists or not. No, no, yeah, you're right. You cut me off at the knees intellectually. So let's not act like, oh yeah, you've come out here with an open mind inviting me to explain to you why I believe God exists. You no, that's did. not what I'm asking. It's you didn't. Not. You cut me right off. I'm not asking you to explain why you believe in God. I'm really not. I because know you're I've not. I've been doing that for 20 years. Right. What, what I want to know is given that I've already decided that, I, that the evidence doesn't support it, am, is the question done? Is there further work to be done here? If I know the, the best evidence supports that there's no God, is there further work? Should I still keep looking? Yeah. Simply because of the knowledge of my own imperfection. Yeah, you sure should. And I told you why. Because like it or not, you have to answer the question. Is human life valuable? If so, why? Well, I've answered those. It has nothing to do with God. Yeah, and you're up a creek without a paddle when it comes to explaining why human life has value if there is no God innate intrinsic value yeah if there is no god i give my life value you give your life value or society gives your life value but it's not innate and intrinsic and which means if you happen to be born value? at the time of the dred scott decision and you happen to be a black person tough luck you are three-fifths the value of white folks according to the u.s supreme court that's what society has decided and my point is, I could give a rip about what society decides. Racism is absolutely wrong because human beings are created in the image of God. They have an intrinsic, innate value that is not determined by my opinion, your opinion, or the United States government's opinion. How is God giving us value more intrinsic than us giving ourselves value? Because if there is no God, your number came up in a Monte Carlo game. You are a freak accident of nature. You do not get value out of a freak accident. You get nothing. You get meaninglessness. Then you have to create your own value. But if you choose not to create the same value tomorrow that you did today, you're not wrong. You're not right. Because it's all a crapshoot. It's all, do you like broccoli or corn? What's your taste? Oh, tomorrow you like the other one more than the one you like today? Just taste. So, you want to be Mother Teresa today? Great, go be Mother Teresa. Tomorrow you want to be Adolf Hitler? Just your taste, go ahead. It's all meaningless, sir. Despair is honest atheism. Despair is honest atheism. Don't take it from me. Really fundamental Nietzsche, logical Camus, disagreements. Sartre, <laughs> Knocked it right out of the ballpark. No, I mean, you yes. can't just say these things. That Read if a person yourself. makes a decision, it's inherently arbitrary. That any person can't make the... You're, you're even bringing up Camus. You're even bringing yeah. up the people who specifically said that people are the ones who make decisions about meaning. And it's all relative. No, it has it's all meaningless. Rel well, just read L'Etranger by Camus. First lines of the book are the words of a young teenage boy who says, Yesterday mother died. Or was it today? Who gives a rip? Life is meaningless. It doesn't matter whether mother died last week or yesterday. Life is absurd. And that's what Camus struggled with. And that's why Camus said the only question modern man must answer is, why not commit suicide? Why go on sucking wind and living? If it's all meaningless, if it doesn't matter whether you're Adolf Hitler II or Mother Teresa II, realize life is a meaningless trip.